All right, guys, I am so excited about this conversation. Today, we are talking with Jonathan Pitts. Now, Jonathan is a best-selling author. He's a speaker, and he's the executive pastor of the Church of the City in Franklin, Tennessee. He will also tell you, and I can see it through and through, he is a proud dad and a big dream advocate for his four amazing daughters. Now, Jonathan has pursued a number of big dreams and has encouraged his family to dream big too. In fact, his oldest daughter had a major role in the movie War Room at the age of 10. How about that? Amazing stuff, right? Uh, but Jonathan will also be the first one to tell you that life can bring major challenges and tough setbacks along the way too. In fact, Jonathan was married to his beautiful bride, Winter, who was a successful author and magazine publisher. Uh, and just as they were putting the finishing touches on their book on marriage, Winter passed away unexpectedly, leaving him a widow and the father of four grieving daughters. So as you can imagine, this totally rocked his world and the future and the big dreams that Jonathan and Winter had planned just seemed to completely dissolve. So he and along with his daughters had to decide how they were going to live life uh, and move forward. And it's been tough and beautiful and messy and wonderfully inspiring. And this journey has been incredible, so much so that he has actually written a new book that offers a real, intimate, raw, and ultimately hope-filled look at grief and how we can live life to the fullest after tragedy. The book is called My Winter Season, Seeing God's Faithfulness in the Shadow of Grief. We're going to be talking about that, but we're also going to talk about going after dreams and continuing to go after dreams and encouraging others to do the same, even when life gets really hard. So let's get to this. It's going to be fun. Jonathan, welcome to Dream Think Do. What's going on, Mitch? Glad My to be gosh, here. man. I'll tell you what, uh, as I've been researched for this, I've just been getting more and more excited. I'm blown away by your story. I'm inspired by your brother. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah, I'm glad to be with you. Excited for the conversation. You've got enough energy, man. I'm just excited just to dive in. So. <laughs> I'll tell you what, we're going to buckle in, man. We're going to have some fun. <laughs> all right. So we got a lot to talk about. I want to talk about the new book and all the events that inspired it. But I want to go back, though, because I think your life is, is kind of the epitome of what we talk about with Dream, Think, Do, that sometimes when you set out on a dream pursuit, you think it's going to go a certain way. It goes a different way. And mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times even better than you might think, although different, right? So if, if my research is correct, you were a business guy, wanted to be a business guy, all about building businesses, growing businesses, revenue, all of that. And winter uh, wanted to be a barista in Italy, among <laughs> a, a number of other things. And obviously your life was much different than that. So get, bring us up to speed. How did, how did you go from being business guy to executive pastor, best-selling author, all of those things? Yeah, I'll try to, I'll try to do it quick, but uh, essentially we were 21 years old, Winter and I, we were almost engaged. And I remember sitting down having a conversation with her and she had told me she wanted to be a barista in Italy and move there. And I kind of wrecked Who that doesn't? dream. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But she told me, she said, she just said at one point, we're sitting on the stoops of her step in this um, place in Philly, Philadelphia we were in, uh, where she was living, we we're just hanging out. And uh, she just says, I want to write a book. And I said, write a book about what? And she's like, I don't know. And I was kind of annoyed. I'm like, well, you, you might want to know what you want to write the book about. And she's, and she basically dismissed me. Like she didn't really care. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I, I was know. just, yeah, I was just guy. I wanted to make a lot of money and be in business and sales and did some sales stuff. And uh, really my life went a different direction. I ended up going into nonprofit management and spent the last 15 years of my life in nonprofit management leadership and doing business in a different way, you know, and it's still business. It's still awesome. Oh, for sure. But over the years, Winter took that one dream she had in her heart and through a bunch of death to self, basically having four daughters, coming home from um, a pretty corporate job where she was a grant writer because she always wanted to write, you know, and yeah. so, but she was all technical writing. But all of that was preparation for the dream that she had in her heart because what would happen is we'd have our four daughters and when our oldest daughter was about seven, her name was Alina, Winter realized there was a gap in the marketplace for resources for tween girls, specifically like Christian content that she wanted our daughter to know. Yeah. And so she sat down one night and she's like, I'm going to create something. And she literally started uh, with Adobe InDesign, a free trial version. And three <laughs> trial versions later on three devices later, she had created what's called For Girls Like You magazine, which is this magazine for, for girls that she created. Which is and still going today, right? Still like going today. It's grown and um, it's still going. It's awesome. And um, but that basically launched her into getting her first offer for a book contract. She would go on to publish. Um, she has more, more, more than 20 resources in the marketplace now, which is Incredible. crazy because all this started in 2011. Right. And all of it's, and all of it's for tween girls, like our four daughters. Um, so it's uh, really beautiful stuff. But it's, what's cool for me is all the things that I felt like I was created to do, I came alongside of Winter in, and my yeah. dreams were being fulfilled as I helped her fulfill hers. 
Right. And uh, yeah, it's just a lot, it's been a lot of fun. Well, that's, yeah. that's what I love. And that's what I love about you guys' story. And we always talk about, you know, with Dream Think Do that so often when we've got a dream, it's like we're walking around with a puzzle piece. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's easy to almost hide the, the things where we need help. Right. But it, oftentimes our puzzle piece meets up with somebody else's puzzle piece and they lock together. And, you know, those people actually get to work out dreams together. Now, in your case, it was you and winter getting to work on these dreams where your puzzle pieces fit together, which yeah. is just so cool. It's amazing. Now, you know, what well, were you thinking when, when she, you know, she starts to say, I think, I think I want to write a magazine. I think I want to write some books, you know, those guys that, what were you thinking? I mean, you're a business guy. I'm sure you probably were also thinking 47 steps down the road. You probably also knew some of the challenges that were coming. Was it hard to encourage? Was it exciting? Was it all of you know, those things? You know, what's funny is I didn't believe in her. Um, I, I can honestly say, yeah, winter, you know, here's the thing. Dreamers, the, the cool thing about dreamers is they have their dream and yeah. typically anything that falls outside of their dream, they say no to. And so the first I'd say, you know, call it seven, eight, nine years of our marriage. I'm watching this girl say no to, she was really good at doing hair. Her aunt taught her how to do hair. She could make lots of money doing hair. She yeah. Do it. She could do corporate jobs doing grant writing. She just kind of, it just, she didn't want to do it. So like I watched her say no to a bunch of stuff and I, and I actually equated that to laziness, which we've talked about, uh, <laughs> in years past well, what's right. funny when she started creating this magazine which at the time she didn't know what it was it was just a resource in yeah. a in, a, in, a, in a, a, a copy of adobe indesign well when she started doing that i saw this girl go from what i would call low productivity to being incredibly more productive than i've ever been in my life i mean she was staying up <laughs> till three and four o'clock in the morning designing and would do that because for the first several years of the, of the magazine she was her own editor-in-chief and did everything. everything herself everything yeah. creative web design, everything. And I would come alongside of her and do accounting to make sure we didn't, you know, get, have tax evasion or something like that. But, <laughs> exactly uh, right. but anyway, she would do it all herself. And so I just, um, I watched this dreamer basically take a dream and put it into, into action just on sheer um, work ethic. Cause she yeah. was doing the thing she was built to do. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. No, but... you, mo <laughs> you most definitely answered my question. And I appreciate the transparency. That's the thing I, I appreciate about, your your style and you guys and the things that you've written and done together is you guys are always open like you there's you don't have to worry about what you guys are thinking about because you're going to know it and I, I really appreciate that as opposed to I think a lot of times people try to hold back and say oh you know so I appreciate the transparency what I would say I mean the, the reason I say it is because I didn't believe in her and I remember the moment when I started believing in her I, we were yeah. actually it was probably a couple of years in and we're sitting down with her book publisher after her first devotional is published and it's done really well. And they're congratulating her. And I'm, I'm thinking, I guess I should congratulate her too. <laughs> and you know, I'm just the slow one. I'm the slow right. One right. The but then you got on board, right? Yeah, like it's amazing. Cause you guys wrote books together. Uh, yeah. obviously, uh, you know, well, and that, that's maybe a good segue into how did then you guys start, you know, I know the dream started to kind of merge where you guys were working on projects together. You were helping her with a lot of the different aspects of the magazine and all the different things. How did it start to work where you guys started to write books together? Yeah. Um, a part of it was she needed, so it started out with her needing an editor for the magazine and I was free labor. And so yeah, and I'm, exactly. I, who's around <laughs> who, Hey, John, then get over here. Yeah. I actually love editing. My mom's a great editor and um, kind of through watching my mom edit my papers when I was a kid and in college, like I kind of learned to edit. And so I would edit her magazine and yeah. it was really through editing the magazine. We started doing some things together. We did like a 30 day prayer campaign, like 30 days of praying for your daughters. And we did that together. That was like the first thing we ever wrote together. And that 30 days to praying for your daughter campaign turned into a book called she is yours. Trust in God as you raised the girl he gave you. So that Which was our first amazing. book we did together. Yeah. And, then our publisher asked if we do a marriage book together, not because we had a perfect marriage, but simply because they're like, you guys look like you're trying the best you can. And we want people to, you know, glean from somebody who's trying, right. you know? So um, we did that together and it just, it really just snowballed. We didn't have, a, we didn't have a strategic, strategic plan. It was all on a dream. It was all in her dream. And I just got on board and started having fun. And what's really beautiful is how everything started working together, even that. And then coming in with my daughter, Alina, who all of a sudden gets cast in this movie that becomes, you know, this, I think it's like the number seven Christian film of all time. Oh yeah. It's incredible. I mean, yeah. I remember the response and I remember people talking about your daughter, not knowing it was your daughter at the time, but like this little phenom of a little girl who actually was really able to deliver at such yeah. a young age. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, yeah. So to have all of that pop 
at yeah. the same time is just incredible. Uh, and how did you guys, my wife is also involved in our business. So mm-hmm. I know that that can be a beautiful, messy, wonderful, <laughs> hard, difficult thing. How was it to write emptied together? Yeah, it was, you know, emptied was a lot of fun. I mean, I, I think I look at our marriage in three, five year phases. Cause we had a 15 year, 27 day marriage. Yeah. First five years was basically us coming to realize that both of us were imperfect, still fighting it. Second five years was us basically deciding we're going to be intentional and working on that. Yeah. And then the last five years were amazing because we were partners in every sense of the term, um, life partners, um, in love, friends, and working together um, in her ministry and I, our wow. ministry that we would create. So it's just been really fun to watch how working on yourselves can actually lead to something really amazing. And we had fun the whole time, but I just look back at it and just, I distinctly see those different parts. Honestly, because we, we learned to, to work together in life. It, it actually wasn't hard to work together in other things. Like I think, you know, if you got a bad marriage and all of a sudden you, you, you import your bad marriage onto your business, that's going to be a bad, that's going to be a bad business relationship. So <laughs> exactly. I think just working on interpersonal skills, working on respecting each other, working on deferring to each other, like the natural things that you'd work on in the hardest relationship you could probably have in marriage yeah. can lend itself to what it can look like in, in business and look like in, in partnership on an entrepreneurial dream or whatever. Absolutely. So, right. It's kind of those that. habits you establish as far as, are you going to trust each other? Are you going to communicate? Are you going to, you know, how are you going to handle difficult conversations? All of those things that absolutely translates if, if you yeah. start to work on a big project or a business or a book or whatever together. So I, I love, I love that observation. And I love the, the, the five-year increments too, because I think that's a great way to be able to look at any relationship and especially a marriage. So that's, that's amazing. So you guys did write, you wrote, wrote emptied together, which mm-hmm. was this book on marriage and then crazy the day that you submit the final draft. And if I, if I saw it, I don't know if your publisher ever found out, but you even Force signed for your wife yeah. to sign <laughs> to sign off, right? To, to get it submitted or whatever. But on that day, your wife unexpectedly passed away. And talk about one of the biggest, I mean, I would imagine such a high point, such a milestone. And then to have yeah. something like that tragedy happen and kind of wrap itself around this dream. Um, you know, how do you, how do you come out of that? Yeah. It was, uh, uh, man, I'll start by saying, I don't know what was crazy. Is this is July 24th, 2018. We were actually, I'd taken a role at church of the city where I'm at now as the executive pastor. We had moved from Dallas to Nashville, um, on July 14th, bought a house in Nashville on July 14th in Franklin, Tennessee, smaller town and, uh, moved into our home, spent four days in Nashville, got our girls into school, um, you know, unpacked a little bit. And then we went back to Dallas for my last week of work at the urban alternative, which is the organization, a guy named Tony Evans runs, maybe some of your listeners know him. And um, while we were there, it was a Tuesday of my last week. And she just texted me and said, Hey, I'm feeling sick, like sick emoji. And then she never responded. And so I just went home that evening and I knew she, she was actually working on a a writing project she had that was due in like a week or actually I think it was overdue. (laughs) She was trying to, the the second deadline was a week from then. Oh, been there. Yeah. She said, I need you to be on tonight. Like with the kids. I don't know what that meant. It meant like, just bring home dinner, get get things done. Take care of things. I gotta, yeah. So Anyway, I, I signed at work. I signed the final edited manuscript of the book, uh, scanned it, emailed it back to our publisher, went home, walked in. She's hanging out with my daughters and my sister-in-law and their daughters doing each other's hair and playing a game laughing. So I was like, oh, I guess We're I'll go take a nap. Went took a power nap, got up, started to make dinner. She went to take a nap just so she could kind of be prepared to write. And I walked to the bedroom. I'll never eat Costco ribs and uh, uh, Caesar salad again because that's what I had. And I walked in the bedroom to floss my teeth and I said, Hey, do you want to, do you want to, um, do you want to eat? And she had, she had, I'm sorry. I went in the first time and said, do you want to eat? And she said, no, I'm going to just t- take a longer nap. I went back in the second time to floss my teeth. And as I was flossing, I just kind of looked out of the, out of the bathroom into the bedroom and she went to her sat up and she was looking out of the window. I was behind her. And, um, anyway, she just fell over. Like, you know, that slouch you do when you're tired, you don't want to get out yeah. of the bed, but something about it looked unnatural. And ultimately what I thought, um, the next couple of moments was like a seizure was, her heart getting off rhythm. And um, basically in combination with a heart murmur, she had her whole life, which wasn't life-threatening that we knew of. Yeah. Um, Her heart stopped and oxygen stopped going to her brain. And I would say the most traumatic day of my life was the easiest transition into heaven for her because uh, she just kind of passed out and gently glided into eternity. And um, I'm saying it really easy because I've told the story a million times. Right. Exactly. It was the most, most traumatic day of my life. Most traumatic moment for me. My three youngest girls were home. 
it was hell on earth. Yeah. And, um, yeah. It wasn't fun. Uh, not at all. And that's, I, I know that you've told that story and I know that that's this story and the book is going to help so many people. So uh, I just so want to honor, you know, one, you're willing to share that, uh, but also speak to, I can only imagine the pain was just beyond words and I'm sure it still hurts every day. Um, but you guys really have found ways. And I, I so appreciate your openness that you are the last person to say that, you know, the next day you looked at the world differently and everything was okay. Right. Like yeah, it, it was, has been, it's been hard. Uh, it was the but, darkest, darkest. The first month was the darkest month I've ever experienced. And yeah. it, the light started to kind of come back over time. And I mean, now I feel like a whole person that's just got like, you know, like something was cut off of me and it's always going to be gone, but I feel like a whole person and yeah. I feel healed and yeah, but it was, it was incredibly difficult. I, not, I, and not just my grief, but then dealing with my girl's grief, I feel like it's even harder than dealing with my own. So. Right. And not to mention, like you were mentioning, you were a family in transition too. Like you guys were in the middle of a move. You had committed to this move to Nashville. So like there were so many moving parts to that time in your life. And, and I know it, it sounds like you went ahead and moved forward. You talked with your daughters. It sounds like one of your daughters actually really came and had a good conversation. Cause I'm guessing, you know, Hey, the dream of moving to Tennessee probably was like, should we still do it? Tell, tell us a little yeah. bit about how you made that decision. Yeah. It was the day before my wife's funeral that Friday and uh, my oldest daughter, Alina, who's a dreamer like her mom and yeah. confident like her mom. She said, daddy, can we take a walk? And I was like, sure. So we took a walk, talked about a couple things. And then she finally said, daddy, are we, are we still moving to Nashville? And I just, I was trying to be this leader and Christian right. dad. I'm like, strong, you know, I'm strong. Yeah. yeah. I was like, you know, we're going to pray about it and talk about it as a family. And in that, honestly, the place I was, was a little bit afraid. Like I have this job that I had in Dallas, I could fall back on. And this sure. family, this Evans family, which is a pretty prominent ministry family that I worked with. It was my wife's family that we were all so close. And so to, it would be an easy fallback. Like I'm going to stay yeah. here and they can help me with my girls. And it would have been an amazing option, but she says, are we still going? I say, you know, like we need to pray about it, think about it, talk about it. And she goes, dad, Mommy wanted us to go to Nashville more than anybody. I think we're supposed to go. And I'm telling you, as soon as those words came out of her mouth, I was like, we're going. And a 14-year-old wow. grieving girl told her dad where the future was. And he <laughs> listened. So, and what, you know, what's really beautiful is we, we got here. And now I realize, like, I thought I was coming here to contribute. And I have. I've been, this church is amazing. It's been fun to be the executive pastor here. Um, but ultimately, God was bringing us here to heal. And wow. I, I would have been so loyal to the thing that I was already a part of that I don't think I ever would have stepped out of it. And I, I probably would have been a shell of a man that never yeah. would have grieved. Right. And I wouldn't have been able to kind of be, for, be there for my girls. Like I was, that's how, that's how I'm thinking about it now. Yeah. And you know, we've been able to heal as a family and my girls probably needed space and margin and the community that received us here. Cause I was coming as the executive pastor. And that week um, my boss, Darren announced to the church, like, Hey, this guy's coming. And he was coming with five women. Now he's coming with four. And yeah. so they just received us and, loved on us in ways I never thought possible, nor could I ever repay. It's been beautiful. That's amazing. Well, I know I saw one interview where your head pastor reached out and gave you the option, right? Yep. Uh, and I mean, that's that's love too, to be able to say, hey, if you need to stay there, stay there. And what he offered that, like, we'll find a way to sell your house. Or whatever. I yeah, mean, that's I mean, just I, an incredible unconditional love there. It's honestly the church at its best because this is, he, he actually just said this the other day is like, you know, uh, the church is supposed to be like the bride and you, you know, in, in any wedding, the bride, when she comes down the aisle, everybody stands up and they turn around and look and they gasp. Yeah. And he basically said, that's what, um, that's what we should be. That's what the church should be when, wow. when we take care of each other. And he said, looking at my story, remember, cause we just had a conversation. Uh, our staff did yes yesterday as I shared the book with them and that's what we should be. That's what it looks like when we're there for each other. When we love each other well. And so, um, yeah, really beautiful. That's so, incredible, cool. man. I just, it, uh, it, you have truly, uh, you know, I don't believe that God causes terrible things in our life, but he can certainly redeem them. And it's incredible how you guys have walked this out together and there's so much redemption and healing in your story, but also I'm sure the ripple effect of this book, getting out and helping people, uh, because we all face grief of different kinds. Obviously yours is an extreme case, but it's, it's something, these are the things that people need to hear about. So, you know, we're in this year, a crazy year of trying to help, you know, to dream together, to go after a million dreams. And, and if we're going to do that, that means that some people are going to be doing that in the midst of, or coming out of really hard 
experiences and tragedies and overcoming and needing healing and all those kinds of things. When you think about, you know, obviously your journey, what are a couple of things that you would want to tell that person that maybe is on the other side um, of, of a real setback, um, something yeah. that really hurt, something that really punched them in the gut? Um, what are a few things that you would share with them to encourage them to continue to dream, to continue to move forward, to continue to, to go and, you know, live life to the fullest? Yeah. Well, I'm a Bible guy and I'm a pastor. So my, yeah. my answer may be a little Bible-ish, but, I, but right. it's, a tru, it's a truism it, yep. that exists beyond the Bible. Uh, so St. Paul says in Philippians 4, he says, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is yeah. honorable, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Paul's basically saying like, look at the glass as half full and look for the silver lining because there's always something true. There's always something honorable. There's always something pure. There's always something lovely. There's always something admirable, even in the worst of circumstances. Yeah. Like, yeah. by the way, he's saying this is a guy that was a prisoner talking right. to people that were persecuted. So like earlier in the chapter says, rejoice always, rejoice in the Lord always. And so it's like this idea of always finding something to celebrate, always finding something to look forward to, always looking for something that you can be grateful for. Yeah. Like having a perspective of optimism and of hope is always available to us if we look for it. Like it's right. always there if we're paying attention. And so I would just say, pay attention to the things in your life, even in your circumstances that are difficult. Because by the way, mine were crazy difficult. I'm this single dad in a new town, in a new church with no friends. Like you got to find something. And so I would just say, have a perspective of optimism and hope um, and train yourself to basically look for those things that are true, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Just dwell on them and think about them. Yeah. Train, your, train yourself to do it because they're there, I promise. Yeah, I love that. And I love that verse because I am a recovering warrior. I don't know how you are on that a front. But, <laughs> oh, yeah. So I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm better than I was yesterday, but I still have to choose that verse every day. And I know in one episode, I can't remember what it was, we talked about how uh, visually it helped me to think about a glass. And I think Paul's talking about that, you know, when we worry or when we, you know, have those doubts and fears, it's like the glass fills up with orange pop, right? Cause I don't like mm. orange pop, but like <laughs> pop, he says, Iowa guy. Pop, pop. <laughs> exactly, <right? laughs> but you know, when he's saying, you know, fill your mind with those things, it's a little bit like throwing Play-Doh in that glass, you know, wow. it's like good stuff. It, it then keeps that other stuff out as much as possible. And you know, that, that has helped me. And so I, I love that you point to that, that wisdom, that verse, obviously, but that wisdom that can, that can um, really make all the difference. And how about for you, as far as, you know, obviously you went on, you, you launched emptied, mm -hmm. you wrote this book. I, I've never asked this question, uh, but man, uh, I love you. And I just love your story. And I love your transparency. I would imagine that some people in this kind of experience almost feel guilty about moving on to new dreams. Um, did you deal with any of that? And if so, how did you work through that? You know, as yeah. far as, especially if, if, you know, you lose a family member, a loved one, you know, to continue to move on with a dream. I mean, it's some of your dreams actually even involved, you know, uh, landing that project or, or launching the project of the book that you wrote with winter. How did you deal with that? Or maybe you didn't, but how, yeah. if you did, how did you deal with that? Yeah, uh, a couple of different ways. One is um, the thing I was really grateful for when she passed away is that we were really intentional in our relationship. We were not yeah. perfect, but we were really intentional. And so when she died, I never had any regret for not loving her the way I was supposed to love her. And so like while she was there, I loved her well. And yeah. so when she died, I was grateful. I actually had, one of the things I struggled with is I kind of had this sense of like, <sighs> like I, I took a breath and I told my counselor, like, I feel guilty that I'm like, I kind of have this moment where I'm breathing. And she said, why would you feel guilty for that? And then she had asked me to describe what it felt like. Yeah. And I said, it feels like accomplishment. Wow. And she was like, why should you feel guilty for accomplishing the vows that you put? Like until death do us part, I'm going to do this thing. And again, it wasn't perfect, but it wasn't. Right. So when she died, I actually felt guilty for feeling accomplished in what I felt huh. God called me to do and gave me to do in, in loving this woman and honoring this woman. The second thing I would say is that I actually felt this real urge to keep carrying on the things that she had. So her, uh, for girls like you, her magazine, I literally said this, st the statement, I will not let her legacy die. I will not let her ministry die. Yeah. And so, and this is cool. This is where it plays into dreams. Like it's always been a dream of mine to kind of just co-create with people. Like I'm kind yeah. of a co-creator. I'm not a, I'm not an ideas guy, but I can take an yeah. idea and I can polish it. 
Yeah. And so basically I felt like winter was kind of in heaven, like, Hey, I'm tired of doing that. You take that thing on now. And so I basically took her, we jokingly called it the for-profit nonprofit because the magazine never made any money. It's too expensive print, you know? Oh man. So, okay. Color print. Ah, right. but yeah. I took, I took my skill set, nonprofit management. I turned her for-profit magazine into a nonprofit and monetized it a different way so that we could grow and take this magazine that had 1200 subscribers then which now has about 5,000 subscribers and basically wow. put it in a place where it can just continue to grow. And so I built yeah. a team and it's a really a, a longer story for another day, but um, yeah. honoring her legacy and helping carry forward things that she started uh, carrying her dreams forward, I guess, in a way also helped me feel good about moving on. Cause moving on didn't mean leaving her behind moving right. on, meant carrying the things that I know I can carry. that are still here that are hers, including our daughters, by the way, right. like investing in my daughters, investing in her fifth baby in this magazine, in this ministry, <laughs> Those things allowed me the freedom to also be thinking about my life and myself in other ways. Because obviously at this point, I'm two and a half years not married and I'm actually right. in a committed relationship. And yeah. that does come with struggles too, because the other thing is that it's not just your own expectations, but other people put their expectations on you right. and what they think is right for you. And they've invested right. in you and your loss. And so it's it does get a little bit murky. And uh, I think honoring the call on your life is the only way you can move forward with the next call, you know, like wow. honoring my marriage to winter, honoring the things we built together, yeah. honoring, raising my girls and putting them first. Um, if I'm doing that well, then I can move forward with other things. Now, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm putting those things like for my girls, for example, if I'm thinking less about them so I can move on, that's obviously yeah. not, but I can, I, I can walk and shoot gum at the same time. So I'm <laughs> managing my girls, raising my girls and I'm going to yep. move on. I'm going to, yeah you know, go into what God's called me to, whether it be That's... work or relationship or whatever. So, yeah. I love it. All right. Dream Think Doers, can you tell why I love this guy? We've been talking <laughs> with Jonathan Pitts. His brand new book is called My Winter Season, Seeing God's Faithfulness in the Shadow of Grief. As we're wrapping this thing up, who's this book for, Jonathan? Like, I know you wrote this book. Uh, you know, it, it's such a powerful read, but what when you think about the book, who is it? Who did you write it to? Yeah. I mean, I think I wrote the book to, um, I, I always say grief is basically dealing with lost expectations. Like you expect yeah. one thing, you got something else. I expected 30 years of marriage, 40 years of marriage, 50 years of marriage. I got 15 years and 27 days. I expected one thing. I got something else. So would that be a, a relationship that's been lost, um, a child that's been lost, God forbid, a job that's been lost in yeah. COVID, everybody's lost something. Right. And so I would say it's written for the person who needs to find perspective in their loss. And my hope is, because really what I do is I tell stories about how God met me in my loss yeah. and how people met me in my loss. And I guess my hope is that it's for somebody that is looking to find perspective in their story yeah. and, uh, and hope in their story. And my hope is that they can find in my story, a glimpse of theirs, like just a glimpse of like yeah. some way, either God's met them or Maybe they, maybe they don't have community. Mine talks a lot about community and people, and maybe, maybe they're looking for community and this might encourage them to go find it. Because yep. I, I, honestly, I think that's one of the main things that we need in COVID. If, if COVID's taught us anything, it's like relationship is more important than anything else. You know? Yep, we can't do this alone. That's right. That's If anything, 2020 taught us is like, hey, we can't do this solo. And, and yeah. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. All right, Jonathan, what's the best way for people to find out more about you? Yeah, they can find more about me at jonathanpitts.net. Um, also for girls like you.com would be the place they could find out about uh, my wife's magazine and kind of all that she's carried on. But yeah, that's awesome. All right. We'll put all of that in the show notes, brother. Thank you so much for bringing the wisdom, the heart, uh, and for being on today, man. I appreciate you. Yeah. I'm just glad to be able to be on with you. Appreciate you.